Okay, so the title of the talk is How to Save a Limb. And uh, this has been a long journey. I'm gonna share with you just some examples of our research over the last so 20 plus years. Um, and uh, just maybe give you a bit of a, a vision into the future and what's on the horizon. And um, that's why the subtitle is Hope, Health and Possibilities because I think you'll see as we walk through this, this journey, um, what, what possibilities there are and where we are uh, in terms of moving the needle. So to start with, um, since ancient times, uh, amputation has been used as a mean to deal with a number of different conditions of the limbs. And also there have been early attempts at saving limbs or doing limb salvage surgery as well. And this is an example of a painting from 1495. And this depicts St. Cosmos and St. Damien attempting to replace a patient's amputated limb, which you can see in the foreground here uh, with the limb from another person. And unfortunately, this, this is the limb of a slave, as you can see the color difference here. Um, and that was kind of the earliest, at least we, as far as we know, historical attempt to, uh, to actually repair or replace a, a limb. And in general, um, there are three main reasons why people do lose their limbs uh, to amputation. And number one is trauma, number two is tumor, and number three is infection. So those are the big three things that we have to battle when we're thinking about how do we save a limb and how do we reconstruct a limb. And of course, the way in which we do this um, with surgery is through limb salvage surgery. And, and all that is, uh, for those who may not be familiar with that term, is is simply doing a surgery to reconstruct the limb following the removal or loss of large parts of our bone, our muscle, or our soft tissue. The main reason we do this in surgery is so that we can um, have good function. So the limb will be functional, it'll be pain-free, and so that people can return to normal activities um, and without any types of uh, limitations. And so that's kind of the goal of limb salvage surgery, but it's certainly challenging. And the reason it's so challenging is that we're trying to reconstruct very large sections of bone or in some cases muscle. And these parts are needed to have normal function. And the way in which we do this currently is either large metal implants or in some cases donated bone from a bone bank or tissue bank. And the challenges that we face is that whether we use metal implants or donated bone, the integration of these implants with the patient's native bone isn't optimal. And there are also a high infection rate, much higher than you would expect with normal orthopedic surgery. Um, and that these implants don't last a lifetime. So many times people face multiple surgeries over their lifetime, multiple major surgeries, and with the associated costs and you know, loss of uh, ability to be active, et cetera, um, over time. Now we've certainly come a long, long way. And you can see some of the very eloquent, um, you know, kind of implants that we use to uh, repair this. This is a tumor in the, um, the thigh bone or near the knee. And this is kind of the total knee replacement with a big endoprosthesis or large metal implant. This is what this looks like being implanted surgically. And this is the outcome. And many times these are successful, uh, but they're still, ways in which we're not doing the job that we would really like to do. Um, there's still plenty of people who uh, continue to experience limb loss, that continue to be um, plagued by the challenges associated with limb salvage surgery. And so really the whole goal of all of our research is that we need to do better. We need to find better ways. So we've been asking the question, why is limb salvage so challenging? And how could we use science and research to help address those challenges? Now, for many years, people, um, especially researchers and doctors, have focused on building better and better replacement parts. And this actually has been quite successful to a point. Um, certainly, building better replacement parts helps, but we've reached a limit. And what we've learned over the years is that a purely mechanical solution is never going to be the, pro the answer. And the reason for this, whether we get very eloquent with these designed parts, what we failed to do is to take into account the complex biology of living systems. So we've been asking the question, can we leverage cellular biology and implant design and interface them to work in concert? 
Put another way, we need to think of the challenge less as a carpentry problem, less as being able to build better and better replacement parts, and more as a gardening problem. How can we use the body's own healing ability that can work in concert with these replacement parts and ask those two things to harmonize together and orchestrate an entire functioning limb? And this is the challenge that we've been uh, trying to address. So we've learned, of course, that um, in this process, humans have limited regenerative capacity. It turns out that when tissue loss, like through surgery or trauma or infection is high enough or great enough, we exceed our own body's ability to regenerate tissue. We hire, the higher, the more complex the mammal is, the complexity of biology like humans comes with a trade-off. More complexity means less regenerative capacity. So we aren't like salamanders, for example. Our bodies are really good at repairing small damage and we certainly can regenerate some tissue, but when we lose a large amount of bone or muscle, we exceed that capacity. A salamander, on the other hand, as you can see here, can experience a limb amputation and regenerate an entirely new limb. So while we are not salamanders, because we have a lot more complexity than a salamander, we can actually learn something very useful about limb regeneration from a salamander. And when you look at how salamanders regenerate limbs, what you see is a very ordered series of a coordinated events that involves first inflammation, and then an entire series of cellular events that are highly coordinated that culminate in complex tissues of multiple types being created simultaneously. And when we look at that, that helps us understand how we could better do this for our own bodies. Um, what's up? So how can we overcome the limited regenerative capacity we higher mammals seem to have? Well, it turns out what we can do is boost the body's own healing capacity. We can supercharge it, essentially. And one of the cells in our bodies that normally works on healing smaller amounts of damage through our lives are stem cells. So all of us have stem cells, even adults. We hear a lot about fetal stem cells um, or embryonic stem cells, but we adults also have stem cells. And these actually are the main repair cells of our body. We can find these stem cells or repair cells in every tissue of our body. And what's really fascinating about stem cells is that they can become multiple tissue types. So they start as sort of this unformed sort of cell and given the right signals, they turn into different types of tissues. Um, and the stem cells that we use to help bones and muscle heal are called mesenchymal stem cells. So these particular kinds of stem cells are of great interest to researchers like myself, because we've been trying to figure out how we can use those cells, which are naturally involved in our normal body's healing response to overcome the limits of regeneration and help us avoid amputation. So what we've learned over many, many years is that if you wanna use these particular stem cells to regenerate muscle or bone in large amounts, you need to give them some kind of direction you need to teach them what you want them to do. And remember, we talked about how those stem cells can become multiple different tissues. We wanna help them become the tissue we want them to become, either bone or muscle, et cetera. And to do this, you need some kind of scaffold, a framework or a set of blueprints that helps them know what to do. So when we think about how we're going to use scaffolds, a good scaffold would have to have three different important features. The first thing is it needs to have growth signals that helps the stem cells multiply. So we wanna assemble the right amount of workers at the right time to actually begin the work of regenerating tissue. The next thing we wanna do is we wanna make sure that the scaffold has the 3D framework that actually mimics the tissue you're trying to regenerate. This is essentially the blueprint. We need to give the cells the blueprint in order to know how to regenerate the tissue that we want. And then the final thing that's very critical is we need differentiation signals. We need something that will tell the stem cells which tissue type to form. So essentially that's sort of like the decorator or the style you know, of what we want a, the final product to look at like. So this is what a scaffold needs to have. And scaffolds can either be synthetic, i.e. they can be man-made or they, they can be biologic. And what we've learned is that it's very hard to create synthetic scaffolds or man-made scaffolds that have all the right ingredients in the right proportions. But we have learned that scaffolds that are created from natural tissues actually work really well. 
well, where do you get raw materials to make scaffolds from natural tissues? Actually, you get them from tissue donors, people who donate their tissues and organs when they pass away. And then we can use these tissues without the cells um, to help us understand, uh, to help us make scaffolds, to help the stem cells understand what to do. So I wanna give you two projects, two examples of projects that actually illustrate this concept. These projects were first performed in rodents. These are laboratory rats in our lab that shows that this approach actually works. And then we move on to a more complex system like uh, that'd be more like a human. So in this case, we have a rat on the left and we're looking at the femur bone here where a section of the bone has been removed and there's a little stabilization device here that keeps the animal comfortable and able to walk on this. But this, this bone has been removed and the amount of bone that's been removed exceeds the body's ability to regenerate. So with no other treatment, this defect here in the bone becomes, remains empty. And you can see that even 84 days after we've done this, there's no new bone, there's no union here. On the other hand, if we use stem cells and we put them on a scaffold, in this case, the scaffold is made from bone, all the mineral and hard um, crystallized material has been removed and all the cells and all have been removed and all that remains really is sort of the scaffold, which has the appropriate growth signals, the framework we talked about and the differentiation signals, 84 days after surgery with that material in there, you can see beautiful bone formation and union. So essentially a healed bone. Another uh, example of this is with muscle regeneration. We talked about how muscle uh, is oftentimes one of the tissues that's um, part of the problem with trying to regenerate uh, um, tissues. Um, loss of muscle, as you can imagine, happens for a number of reasons. You think about warfighter injuries and other types of trauma. And the problem when you have a lot of tissue loss in your muscle is that you really have limited ability to bring muscle from somewhere else in the body and use it for construction. You can't use donated, truly donated fresh muscle to, to do this because it has the cells of an, another person and that would create an immune response and be rejected. So how these are typically treated is essentially just leaving them as defects and allowing them to scar in. And when that happens, you have diminished function, um, you have a really, you're really prone to re-injury um, and um, a poor cosmetic outcome. So, you know, muscle is used to fill out all the contours of our body. And so clearly this changes the contour when it's just a scar tissue. Um, so what we have taken the approach uh, with is that could we use muscle that's uh, given to a tissue bank and actually remove the cells from another person, the donor, to make a non-immunogenic scaffold. If we could do this, this would be natural. It'd be biocompatible. It would have the right framework and all the signals that we talked about. Um, and um, we actually took a long time to figure out how to do this. And what you can see here at the top is this is muscle that has not been, the cells have not been removed. And this is muscle where the cells have been removed and all the um, elements that would be uh, an immunogenic or create an immune response have been taken out. And all that's left now is the scaffold. So this was a, a lot of months of work trying to figure out how to do this without creating a lot of mush in the bottom of a beaker or creating um, scaffolds that really didn't retain their signals. But eventually we were successful thanks to research dollars provided by the Limb Preservation Foundation actually. We were actually able to do this um, eventually and create a scaffold that, that retained all its signals and its framework um, and then would allow cells to infiltrate it. And that's exactly what we did. We took new stem cells and we reintroduced them to this decellularized muscle or this muscle scaffold and allowed those cells to um, understand the framework, understand the signals and eventually form a new muscle that would work because we knew we had the growth signals, the framework and the differentiation signals that were so important to the scaffold. So we actually showed that we could do this. Um, this is in a rat again. And what we did is we removed a, a large portion of muscle in one of the limbs that's too large to heal on its own and repaired it either with um, nothing or with the cellular scaffold where we reseeded it with the stem cells. And what we're measuring on this side is we're measuring the peak force or the peak contraction of that muscle. And we were comparing it to the opposite leg that didn't have surgery, so the normal leg. What you can see here in this little video, if you watch is this twitch right now, and we'll watch it happen again here in a second. And right, here, we see the twitch and we're measuring how much strength that muscle has relative to the normal limb. And what we learned is that we could actually recover 97% of the function as compared to the opposite normal limb.
there's only 40% recovery if you didn't use the scaffold and the stem cells. So we were able to recover that. Now, all this has been wonderfully successful and we've been very excited about that, but we still have one major problem. And that is that mice and rats are not people. They are more complex than a salamander per se, but they are orders of magnitude less co complex than a human being. Think about it, they live in a, in a completely controlled environment. They're essentially identical twins to one another. Um, those are all important things to know when you're trying to figure out how something works or if it's even feasible. But when you try to bring what we learn in mice and rats into a human population, we run into a bunch of problems. And this is something that's been widely recognized in recent years that mice really and rats are not necessarily always the best subjects to study human disease. They're great for basic research and we can do a lot of things in the mouse successfully, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work in humans or translate into to a, 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 a treatment that actually works in people. And so what we found is that we're learning all of these wonderful things and creating all these great discoveries, but yet very few of them actually have ended up being useful in people. Um, and we call this the translational gap. This is the fact that we're accumulating all this great knowledge and potential, but we still have not successfully always bridged it over into people. Um, and actually 90% of the time when we try to go from mouse to man, that translation actually fails. And yet, interestingly, this is a deeply entrenched paradigm in the scientific world that, you know, what works in mouse should be able to work in, in people. And that's been shown over and over again that that doesn't happen. So what we need is a better bridge across the gap. We need something to cross over this translational gap so that we can actually make it from the laboratory to the bedside. So it turns out that pets, our pet dogs and cats, also experience limb-threatening bone and muscle loss. And for a lot of the same reasons that we humans get the same problems. Um, you think about military working dogs or police dogs, um, even infection or even um, vehicular injuries. So dogs being hit by cars, et cetera. And unfortunately, um, dogs also get bone and uh, soft tissue tumors very similar to people. Um, and we actually perform limb reconstructions, as you can see here, for the same reasons in this, and in the same way as in humans. But what's valuable about this is that these are naturally occurring uh, conditions. We don't give them cancer. We don't give them trauma. This happens in their everyday lives. Sadly, as we talked about, cancer of the bone is very common in dogs, more common than it is in people, actually. And um, uh, soft tissue sarcoma, which affects muscle as well, is often uh, is very common in dogs. In fact, bone cancer are, is the most common uh, primary uh, bone reason for people to have amputation that performed in their pets. The other interesting thing is that bone cancer in dogs is identical to human bone cancer. So you can see here, uh, um, this is actually an example of a bone cancer in the upper arm of a child. And you can see the x-ray here. This, although a little harder to see, is the bone cancer in the upper arm of a dog. And you can see the x-ray here. And to the trained eye, you can see a lot of similarities here. In fact, if you were to take a section of tumor from this person and a section of tumor from this bone, this dog, and put them both under the microscope and ask the pathologist to look through the microscope and tell you which came from the human and which came from the dog, they would not be able to tell you because on a cellular level and even on a molecular level, these cancers are identical. So while that may be very sad for dogs and for people, it also provides a very good opportunity um, because as I mentioned, we do limb salvage in dogs. Um, as a, a treatment for bone cancer. And if those of you who might be curious have never seen uh, what this looks like, this is actually a limb salvage surgery being performed in one of my patients. And I think you could probably say that this looks extraordinarily similar to a human OR. It's a very large complex team. You have multiple different roles with different people in the room. Uh, there's a lot of uh, very painstakingly um, attention to detail in terms of infection control, et cetera. So this is the kind of thing that can be very well translated between dogs and humans. And in fact, all these different techniques of how we save limbs actually has been done in dogs. You can see some interesting different types of custom implants. Um, you can even see these uh, intraosseous transcutaneous approaches, which is really kind of a combo of an external prosthesis like this blade prosthesis and something that goes inside the bone here in this basset hound. 
So these are things that are done in veterinary medicine already. But on top of that, dogs are actually much more like humans than, for example, laboratory mice. Um, pet dogs get excellent health care into old age and they live into old age. There's a large population size of these animals. Um, they have conditions that require limb salvage that happen naturally. They need our help to begin with. They get hit by cars and they have cancer like we do. And they also have a compressed lifespan. So their disease progression happens more quickly and also their healing and other parts of the, the post-operative phase happen more quickly. So what would take decades and decades to study in people can be done in a matter of four to five years in pet animals that already need these surgeries anyway. And unlike laboratory mice, these animals sleep with us, they share our food and water, they're exposed to the same environmental stresses and lifestyle choices such as sedentary lifestyles or active lifestyles. They predictably age with us uh, very rapidly, um, but uh, more rapidly than people. And unlike laboratory mice and rats that are essentially identical twins of each other, they are just as variable in all our sizes and colors and, um, and different personalities as people are. And so in that way, they mimic humans much more uh, closely. So instead of trying to go from mouse to man, what we're, our approach is, is to, to bring what we're learning in mice into these pet dogs that already have these natural um, diseases because we believe that this is a faster way and a more accurate way to translate these discoveries into people. So it turns out that we have this very translational model, this bridge across that translational gap that's been walking alongside us all this time. And this mimics the biologic complexity, the lifestyles and the environment of people unlike any other laboratory animal. And because of this, we're better able to model and predict how tissue regeneration strategies like the ones we've discussed today is going to work in people. And not only can we impact human health, but we can also impact animal health as well. So this is a huge success for us. So I wanna end this uh, talk with a, a story. And um, this is me on the left. And when I first entered the surgery world during residency training, I was 100% certain that I wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon. In fact, I was sure I wanted to go into private practice and work you know, four days a week doing lots of surgery on pet dogs. Uh, and then I met these two gentlemen, you recognize Dr. Wilkins here, and many of you will know the other person here on the right, his name is Steve Withrow. He was one of my mentors as well. And what I learned was about their shared vision and that by leveraging the powerful similarities between pet dogs and people, we could move the needle in ways that nobody else had envisioned before. And for me, this person that was headed down one track, I shifted all of a sudden, my world completely shifted. And I realized that there was a much bigger role that I could play. Um, and that by following in the footsteps of these two gentlemen, I'd not only be making a difference in the animals that we share our world with, but that we could change the future for people too. And that was what really shifted my entire career track toward research and toward where we are today. So our work at CSU and the things that I presented here are only a fraction of the work that has been ongoing. Um, but that work is really dedicated to that vision created by Dr. Wilkins and Dr. Withrow and to Dr. Withrow's legacy. And the Limb Preservation Foundation through the generosity of donors like yourselves have raised enough money to create the Ross M. Wilkins Endowed University Chair, which supports the cutting edge, re cutting edge research that you just heard about and will continue to do so into perpetuity. I am the thankful and grateful steward of that vision and that chair position and the work that I've shared tonight is evidence that we have been successful and that this is really where the help and the possibilities begin. So I wanna leave you with one last thought and that's a comment about legacy. That what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments but what is woven into the lives of others. And I wanna thank you Dr. Wilkins for weaving the fabric of your work into me and to those who come after me. And I thank you, the donors who believed and continue to believe in this idea, because together we're building the most important thing of all, and that is hope. So thank you so much.